Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Ken Orenick, and uh, I'm one of the committee members of the Library Instruction Roundtable Teaching, Learning, and Technology Committee. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. We have two presentations. I'm certainly going to be absolutely terrific. Uh, again, thanks for coming. Uh, a couple of announcements to make. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the committee uh, for all the hard work they've done in, in preparing uh, all these uh, uh, webinars to take place, and this is the second webinar of three. Uh, this is the second one, Best Practices in Instructional Design. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, especially uh, Alyssa Archer, uh, who's uh, uh, handling uh, all the setup for our uh, webinar presentation today. Uh, unfortunately, she was not able to join us. Uh, for some uh, personal reasons, but we have some awesome backup in the uh, way of Jason Burton, uh, one of her colleagues. So if you have any questions about uh, anything that's going on uh, within the webinar, if you have any sort of technical uh, difficulties, uh, please feel free to use the chat box in the lower left-hand corner, and uh, Jason will be right on it and try and help you uh, troubleshoot any of those issues. Okay, uh, this webinar is being recorded, uh, and access will be available uh, uh, after the webinar. I believe a link will be sent out, and at least it will be posted on the uh, website. Uh, so you have to check back to the alert website, and uh, you'll be able to view the uh, presentation. Uh, as far as questions uh, and answers, Q&A are concerned, uh, we're going to hold off on all questions. Uh, our panelists will hold off on answering all questions until the completion of both presentations. So uh, when you have questions, please feel free to uh, uh, put them in the chat box, and I'll do my best to uh, uh, moderate and get them out to our presenters uh, at the uh, end of the actual presentations. And the chair of our committee, Cynthia, just posted a link on the left-hand side uh, to the uh, website uh, for the webinar. So uh, just keep that link handy and you'll be able to access that uh, once we're able to get it uh, up and running. Okay, so uh, for our first presentation, uh, it's entitled Hashtag Library TV, Flipping the Classroom for the YouTube Generation with Engaging Digital Content. And we have three librarians from George Washington University and I'd like to introduce them now. Uh, a little bit of uh, information about our presenters. Uh, Jocelyn Leventhal uh, is the Online Education and Off-Campus Services Librarian. Uh, Shira Lolov Eller is the Art and Design Librarian. And Tina Patel is the Government Documents and First Year Experience Librarian. Our presenters today will make up uh, the How Do I Do team which leads the creation of online learning objects at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Uh, each presenter has a rich background using technology to enhance learning outcomes, including teaching synchronous online sessions, being embedded in in-person and online classes, and using social media tools to demonstrate research skills. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn the mic over to our uh, presentations. Again, if you have any uh, presenters, excuse me, and again, if you have any questions uh, that you'd like to give the presenters or if you're having uh, any problems with technology, feel free to chat on the left-hand side. Take it away. Great. Thank you. Um, well, we're happy to be here. Thank you for having us. Um, me. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about um, our work with flipping the classroom and using the digital objects that um, you mentioned in our introduction. Um, so this will be interactive, uh, so please um, you know, respond to the questions. I think that we can have a really lively uh, discussion. Um, so yeah, without... Oh, and to give you an overview of what we'll be talking about today. So Shira will be starting us off um, kind of giving some context to the discussion. Um, and here we are. So Shira here is in the middle. She's going to be talking um, about uh, the work that we do here and you know, just kind of talking about the flipped classroom. Tina is going to be introducing um, some examples of our work. 
And then myself, Jocelyn, I will be talking about um, how we engage faculty. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to Shira now. Hi, everyone. This is Shira. So um, just to sort of get a baseline for everyone, I just want to talk about what the flipped classroom is. So I have up here um, part of the definition that ACRL provides um, from their Keeping Up With series on and the one from flipped classrooms. So they say a flipped classroom inverts the traditional educational model so that the content is delivered outside of class while class time is spent on activities normally considered homework. So that's kind of what we're going to be sort of talking about. Um, and the, the, actually, the, the example from ACRL goes on um, with different examples of how you do this. So students may access instructional material through videos, podcasts, online tutorials um, before the class meeting. Then during class time, students work on activities which, and this is their term, force them to apply what they have learned. So um, for us, um, we're sort of taking that idea of um, using the flipped classroom and, and just as I'm talking, thinking about um, what does the flipped classroom mean to you? Um, and, and if you could, uh, if you want, go ahead and put that in the chat box. But for us, we're going to be talking about how we use watching videos before class. Um, so we assign that to uh, the students through their faculty members. And then within class, completing a handout, exercise, or discussion. Um, so uh, I see a bunch of people typing, which is great. So um, I'm just going to give you a few more seconds to give us some of your ideas about what the, what the classroom means to you. Um, and then I'll keep going. Okay, so this is great. Giving students responsibility for their learning process. I really like that. Um, where it's like they need to do something on their own time, so they're thinking about it, not just they're not just showing up in class. Um, to sort of intake information and just see what happens, that they know what's coming. Um, lecture content, lessons online, yeah, definitely active learning and not busy work. So that's great. So um, the opportunity to really engage during class time, we're having sort of informational uh, videos and different things to do outside of the class. So thank you so much. You can feel free to keep typing there, um, and I'm going to keep going. Um, with our uh, content here. So we have these series called the How Do I Videos. Um, and the videos that we create with the, the series that we call How Do I are multi-purpose. So we use them for flipping the classroom, which is what we're really going to be focusing on today. But they're quite a time commitment to create, and they take a lot of thought and work. And so it's not just one purpose, it's multi-purpose. So we're embedding them in LibGuides. As you can sort of see um, with a the screenshot there, you can see that I have one embedded. And there's one I say, check out this link on the tutorial. So there's different ways of being able to embed those. We have a whole web page on our website that's just tutorials. And then also for chat and email reference, librarians can sort of insert them instead of explaining something that could be complex or time consuming to explain. Um, over email or chat. So our best practices for creating our How Do I videos. Um, and Jocelyn's going to talk a little bit more about examples of this. But basically, we want to make sure that our videos fill a need. So are they something that supports student learning? They support lesson plans given by instructional librarians in concert with faculty? Are they common questions? Um, do they support uh, aspects of the ACRL, ACRL framework for information literacy, um, et cetera. And so in this way, we're focusing more on concepts than something like a mechanical step-by-step -step, um, you know, through a database or something. Because we also don't want to reinvent the wheel. Like We don't need to make a video on using LexisNexis because they've already created a suite of videos for that. 
We also use the rule of thumb of under two minutes um, because research does show that viewership will drop off from videos after that time period. So it really also helps us focus on um, being succinct and only talking about the one skill that we're trying to communicate and not covering every single aspect or every single thing. So we have a specific process that we use to create the videos um, and we work as a team. So this working as a team really helps because with explaining things, um, especially concepts, the way you explain it to yourself might make sense, but then when other people hear it, they're like, that wasn't clear, that stuff's not clear, that kind of thing. So really bouncing it off of each other. So our process, we do it sort of twice a year at different uh, kind of times when we can sort of uh, begin the process. Um, so first of all, identifying topics, as I had mentioned before, so those information literacy type skills that we know that are going to be useful for those multiple purposes. We always write a script and we find that this really helps with focusing, keeping down to those two minutes, not rambling, that kind of thing. Um, it also helps later at that step, which I'm going to get to in number four for captioning. We also create storyboards. So with our script, we make sort of a table which can be made in any program like Word or Google, uh, Google Docs. Um, so on one side we'll put what we're going to say and then on the other side we would put ideas for what the imagery would be, either like a screen capture, um, a PowerPoint slide, um, something to help visualize and be engaging um, for people watching our video. We of course record our voices um, reading the script, so again, we have that script, so it really simplifies the recording. Um, and we tend to make um, a separate audio recording from our video, because uh, it's very hard to sort of do it at the same time. Um, and people could maybe ask more about technology later, but I'll just put it out there that we use Audacity for the audio file. Um, number four, edit and caption. So we personally, um, as a team, use Camtasia, which is a software that we've all learned, um, but it depends on your uh, level of skill. You don't have to feel like you need to use Camtasia. You can use something like Jing, which is a screen capture, um, anything like anything on uh, Macs, so anything that really is something you're comfortable with. We publish these online, which is the next step. Um, we you can use video, uh, Vimeo or YouTube, anything that allows you to upload and then embed. So number six being promote. So we promote these videos as I sort of circling back to what I said before. We promote them to faculty for use in the classroom. We embed them at different points throughout the library website at points of need. Um, and so we're really making sure that these get uh, use. And then the last part is maintain. This is a really important step because while we do try to avoid a lot of uh, kind of showing of the website that might change, it's kind of inev inevitable in some places. So we actually really just got a new homepage, so we had to switch out some images of our website. So just making sure that these stay current um, and putting them in a form where updating it isn't going to be too onerous, where you have to feel like, oh my gosh, I have to redo the entire thing. So, um, what are, if you make videos, um, I, we're interested what in our, what are your video best, best practices or tips and tricks. Um, so if you want to go ahead and put those into the chat box as well, um, we'll be interested to see if any of our tips kind of resonated with you if you do similar kinds of things or if you have things that we can learn from you about, that would be awesome. Um, so as you type, I'm going to next um, turn it over to Tina. Edit in smaller chunks, that's great. Try to keep them as short as possible. So these are really great. 
Um, so keep typing, brevity. Yes, it's a um, it's a refrain here. So I'm turning it over to Tina now. Um, and I love your chat. You can keep going on them. She's going to talk about real world examples of how we use the modules in class. Thanks, Shira. Um, so I do want to say that um, all of the videos are on our website, which is library.gwu.edu forward slash how do I. So if um, I'm going to just show you screenshots. If you want to watch any of the videos, they are available on our website. Um, and I'm going to talk about three specific examples that are used in classes, but also have um, usefulness outside of just using them in a flipped classroom. And the first one that I'm going to show you is um, called Using Google Scholar. This is a module that we created actually based on a library session that I do with one of our faculty in the university writing program. And it's just a basic explanation of what Google Scholar is, how it allows you to do multidisciplinary research. Um, I use this in particular with an assignment where students will watch this video as part of their homework, and then they have a short exercise that they need to complete. And then they will come in, um, having done some searches in Google Scholar, I use an example that the faculty will sometimes give to students to explain the difference between line of inquiry and object of study. And then the students will come into class with questions that are based off of their homework, and also will give them an opportunity to continue to practice their searching in our library session, but they have already kind of understand, they already understand what the session is about because they've watched the video. Um, and these are, again, these are just screenshots. You'll notice that we also provide the captions below. That's the part that says for multiple points of views, scholars, make them accessible for all of our students. The next example is a video that's called Finding Articles by Citation. And it's a pretty straightforward example of a video that we do that shows you how to do a particular discrete task. So if students have a citation and they need to look up that, they need to find the article by the citation, it gives you exactly how you would do that um, via the library website and via the databases. Some faculty will use this um, actually They'll just put it in the syllabus for students to watch the video, and they won't, they'll ask their students to find their course readings this way if their course readings are articles. Um, and then sometimes students will be asked to show that, to watch this video for a library session, and then come to class to bring an article to discuss. Um, and again, as Shira was talking, this will have, this video has use beyond the classroom because we will also show this to students via our chat, um, our chat reference where students might have a citation. We'll send them a video to watch along with the, di along with the directions. And again, these are the screenshots um, of this particular video. And then the third is one that actually goes along with that video called Citation Chasing. And it's a little bit more conceptual. So we explain the process of reading an article and finding an article in the bibliography that you want to find. So this is, this is something that um, Jocelyn actually uses where students will watch both this video and the finding an article by citation video so that they understand this more complicated and more advanced research technique um, of finding a citation in an article that they then use to use as part of their research. And our question for this is, what topics would you consider covering in a pre-assigned video? So if you want to go ahead and type your answers into the chat box, um, we're really interested in hearing the ways that you guys have flipped the classroom um, and the topics that you would assign for students to watch before they come to your sessions. Get to know the library website. That's definitely helpful. Ooh, an introduction to using special collections. That's actually one that we're going to be working on over the summer. So 
any information you have about that would be great. <laughs> Finding articles, navigating the library, awesome. Yes, we'll be talking to you, Carrie. Um, interlibrary loan, awesome. So I'm going to turn it back over to Jocelyn, and she's going to talk about um, the, the faculty response to using the flipped classroom in the videos that we provide for them. Ooh, primary versus secondary. <laughs> Cool, thank you. We might be uh, using some of these ideas. Um, yeah, and actually, uh, Shira pasted a URL to um, all of our How Do I's. Um, and so you'll see that there's, you can see all the videos that we've created and then um, our web pages as well. Um, so, yeah, let me start off by um, giving a little background on our instruction program. Um, most of the examples that Tina was talking about um, are our work with university writing programs. This is a first-year writing program, and you probably have something just like this at your institution. Um, and it's a focus on rhetoric. It's not really a, like a literature class. Um, and we're pretty deeply embedded like, with this program. We work really closely with the, with the faculty. Um, this program has been going on since 2003 in its current form. Um, I mean, librarians and faculty often work together, like co-creating assignments and exercises, um, publishing together. Um, and we typically teach between two to three sessions a semester for each class that we're paired with. Um, and as you can see here, like, we've received awards also for this program. Um, so we received ACRL, the Information Literacy Best Practices Project, Exemplary Program Award. Um, so, in terms of selling it to faculty, um, we leverage that partnership that we have with the university writing program to assign the videos ahead of time. Um, but just as a kind of aside, uh, we do realize that not everybody has that close of a relationship with their faculty. Um, and I know that for me, I'm the distance librarian, so a lot of the faculty that I work with, um, and I'm still making inroads with them. Um, and so I use these videos as a way to kind of demonstrate our value. Um, I use it a lot when, I don't know what another term for this is this, but like cold calling basically. I'll reach out to them and I'll say, oh hey, you know, I've become aware of a research project that you have. Here are some resources that the library has that would be really helpful. Um, so even if they never um, invite me to come teach a session, they at least have these resources or can refer students to them um, or post them in their Blackboard or, or whatever the case may be. Um, so I've used that to help establish new partnerships. Um, so in this program that we have with the uh, University Writing, um, we find that it creates a lot more buy-in if the faculty member is assigning these videos in advance. Um, it demonstrates our value and that the librarian isn't just a like, guest lecturer, but an actual partner in this learning process. Um, so what the videos do is they allow us to impart information regarding task-based skills and save valuable class time for working on more complex ideas and thinking. Um, so on the left, you see a screenshot of one of our videos, how to choose a subject-specific database. Um, this is something that, and then you have hundreds of databases, like this is something that clearly needs to be covered. Um, but at the same time, you know, the step one, step two, step three is, you know, can really be done outside the classroom. So you can save the time inside the classroom for talking about once you find those articles, you know, how do you analyze the bibliography and how can we follow an idea forward and backward in time and just kind of really delving more deeply into that analysis and synthesis instead of, you know, just kind of hovering at the information level. Um, and then, uh, as Tina mentioned, um, one of our videos is citation chasing. And this is one that a lot of our librarians use um, within our classes. Um, so this covers kind of a more abstract concept. So this is something that we are already working with faculty on, um, and then we created the video later as a supplement to that. 
Um, so we're able to introduce this concept, which you know maybe students haven't even like considered before, and then we can use time in class to allow the concept to like be cemented, and then to delve into that more like synthesis and then evaluation aspect um, of the work. Oh, so this is a, a screenshot from the citation video. Um, so this is one of our faculty responses. Uh, um, so, the, so these, so referring to the videos, are helpful for shifting straightforward demonstrations to homework to save class time and more interactive and complex work, which was really the goal. So it was really great to be able to hear the faculty um, you know, basically tell us that our, we had achieved our goal in this way. Um, yeah, Jason, interesting question. Do you have any tips on how to ensure students have watched the videos before class? Um, I mean, I think that having a good relationship with the faculty will certainly help that. Um, Oh, that's okay. I think we have time now, um, and that's a good point that I, I should cover. Um, I think that having a really good relationship with the faculty can like help ensure that. Um, but I mean, it's like any homework; like they may or may, may not do it. Um, but yeah, I think that as long as the faculty is saying like this is part of our class and not just something extra, like you know, a field trip to go to the library, I think that then um, it just uh, lends more weight to the request. Um, so what are some unique ways that you use to engage faculty? Um, I mean, these are just a couple of ways that we use these specific tools. Um, I mean, certainly some of our other colleagues are using other combinations of the videos. I know I've used the videos to share um, with the faculty so they can post it within the Blackboard later. Um, I know that during our classes, especially if we have one-shot sessions, we end up covering so much information that students can't possibly remember everything. So the videos are also a really good way to kind of review um, some of the concepts that we've covered. So what ways have you found um, work for engaging faculty? I see a couple of people are typing, that's great. Okay, yeah, to introduce yourself um, on, a, I guess, on like a Blackboard posting or on the syllabus. Yeah. Yeah, I found that the most success I've had in terms of getting like reference questions directly from the students from the classes that I've taught in is if the faculty refers them to me, because the faculty is going to be their first line. Um, yeah, so that's a really good way. Yeah, yeah, to kind of have it built into the contents building. That's really good. Um, yeah, actually, there was a really good presentation last week talking about talking about um, like embedding resources within uh, the course itself. Okay. Well, thank you for. Um, all of your responses. Here's our contact information. We'd be happy to hear from you. Um, please check out our uh, video page of your, or our How Do I page if you're interested. It has both um, like web page tutorials and then also you know the the rest of the videos that we've created. Um, and we'd be happy to answer any of your questions that you have uh, after Rhonda's after Rhonda's presentation. Okay, uh, thank you so much presenters, uh, Jocelyn, Shira, and Tina from George Washington University. Uh, learned so much from your presentation. Uh, 
look forward to continuing the conversation uh, after our next presenters. So uh, think about your questions and uh, post them to the chat. And again, I'll be moderating them uh, as they come up and uh, towards the end of our uh, time in our presentation. So uh, without further ado, uh, I would, well, first off, I would like to mention uh, that we do have a Twitter hashtag going on. I've been moderating a lot of other things. Um, uh, it is uh, at the bottom left-hand side, hashtag digital uh, pedagogy. So if you have any comments there, uh, please feel free to use it as well. Um, now, uh, I'd like to introduce our second uh, presenter. Uh, and uh, it is Rhonda uh, Huseman. And she's the director of University Library Services at Marion University in Indianapolis. Rhonda's experience in teaching both online and face-to-face -face courses includes education, sociology, and instructional design, with a focus on high school to college readiness skills, first year experience, and project-based learning. So join us for a pre uh, presentation entitled, Our Participation Points Don't Count, Active Learning Strategies and Digital Tools for Everyday Use. So I will turn the microphone over to you, Rhonda. Thank you. Hope everybody can hear me okay. Let's see if he... Um, good. Okay, I'm in control of the slides now. That, that's a good thing. <laughs> um, otherwise, you might just keep us on track if somebody else is advancing the slides, right? Um, <laughs> so I'm glad to be here today. Um, I, I was frantically typing and tweeting and writing things down from the first presenter. So thank you so much. It got me thinking about a couple of things that um, I need to do as well with, with video content. Um, it, it's a lot of planning and effort, so I really commend the first presenters on, on your efforts. Um, what I'm going to talk to you today is about is a lot of different avenues that you might want to take as you are either participating um, with faculty in a class, whether it's face-to-face -face or online, or if you are privileged enough or happy enough or, uh, as we call it, volunteer-forced, is, is that a word, um, <laughs> to teach an online class or to teach a class face-to-face -face that's for credit. Um, I've done all of those things in the past, and um, it takes a lot of work to plan them out, and so I hope that you get um, some tools today that might help you do that. So. Um, the first thing we're going to do is look at a classroom here, and um, this did not even look like the classroom I went to as a child, but I wanted to ask a question about um, if you presented a picture of this to your students, let's say you're using this as a sort of a conversation starter. So what is this room and what happens here? And if you want to answer in the chat, that would be great. Um, some things to think about. Is this a yes or a no question? And then how do you engage students in feedback, conversations, or deeper thinking about this answer? What is this room and what happens here? What do you think? Learning. <laughs> this just seemed like an engaging place. Listen and copy. Okay. Watching. So what I really wanted to talk about with this perspective, thank you for all of you, those of you that are typing and watching it carefully too. Um, when we participate with students, when we ask them, um, it could have been engaging, it very well could be. Um, when we ask them, to think about their learning. Is it really the place that they're in? So is the, does this classroom restrict the way that they learn? Um, we don't know where they are if they're online. They, bear, they could be in Starbucks. They could be in the library. Um, they could be in, uh, on their break at their job. It could be 1 AM and um, their kids are finally in bed. Um, it could be a variety of things. And when we don't have the con confines of a typical classroom setup, we have to really think about what it is that we're doing um, that might appeal to them in a different way or perspective. 
The other advantage, though, of this kind of a classroom, there are some very set expectations, probably, um, about participation. Um, you had to be prepared, or you may have um, been called upon and you weren't ready to go, or um, there might, be, have, might have been others in the classroom who um, didn't either help to support you or were, weren't maybe looking, learning the same things at the same rate that you were. So I think we have to think about online and teaching in face-to-face -face sort of situations. Um, we're really looking at the person as a learner. They're bringing some context and some experience to this place. And so um, my real point with this was we get caught up in discussion forums online or we get in the classroom and we have to move beyond the question, I agree. Um, this was really a challenge to sort of think about this when, I'm asked, when I asked all of you to think about what happens here. You can't answer, I agree. Um, <laughs> you have to think about what it is that I know about this situation, or if I don't know, you can very well say, I don't know. I, I don't know what this classroom is. Can you explain this a little bit more to me? So I'm hoping that some of the things we're going to talk about here in this kind of an environment, um, it is the variety of experiences, technology, abilities, all of those things that happen, and hopefully we'll have some, some tools or some um, teaching um, pieces that happen that uh, will help you do that. So um, the other thing that we have to think about then as you're, the other um, presenters in this series um, is really getting at these questions about um, why are we here? What, what's the purpose of teaching this content? Um, who is here? Where have they come from and where do we want to go? And then thinking about um, ability, capability, and time. In, you know, when is this going to happen? How far in advance do I need to know how to prepare this? Both you as the teacher, but then also really preparing students and saying, this is how long this is going to take. So if I ask you to do this thing, whatever it is that I'm going to show you here in just a few minutes, um, what happens at the end? So what do I need to you know, anticipate and planning? And the first presenters were really mindful of that, but you have to have a script. You have to have a plan when you're putting together your video. So this is a great thing checklist to think about. Um, if you're teaching online, how is it different than face-to-face -face or vice versa? So how is this different? What, what do I have to do differently in order to make these um, outcomes be successful? How do you then determine what those outcomes and assessment are? Um, this might be in alignment with um, a discipline-specific um, faculty or teacher. It might be something that you are doing as a program within your library or institution. Um, and, or it could be something that you're following, um, whether it's professional organizations, you know, ACRL, ISTE, AASL, whatever you're using um, to maybe think about those kinds of things. Did you get a chance to review those important things that I have listed there? Um, sometimes this is elusive, um, right? Syllabi, um, is there a course calendar? Where do you fit in? Or if you're teaching this, how are you reviewing all of those things and what, putting the components together? One of the things that I really, um, really try to emphasize if I'm teaching in any sort of capacity is some kind of needs assessment. So if you do have the luxury of being able to create a survey or having a questionnaire or some other kind of co um, content that you can collect about the students prior, that if you get stuck, um, if you're asking them to do something with technology that may or may not be at their level or across the board, um, you may have two or three students who are really on board and everybody else um, is really struggling actually with the technology piece versus the learning that you're trying to get them to um, achieve, what can you do to do that? So um, I usually just ask basic technology questions. Um, are you, do you have the ability to download something? So if I ask you to use a program, can you do that on the computer that you're going to use for this class? Um, sometimes there are places, um, particularly schools, I've run into that issue before where K-12 schools sometimes have a lockdown. They don't allow software to be loaded or you can't view programs. Um, is there something that you have to do in order to uh, make your computer capable of doing these things? So you don't want them to get stuck before they even get started. The other thing that I have a tip about with doing this is um, if you're teaching online, and this is not a synchronous class, so it's asynchronous, students can log in and log out whenever they have the chance, send, have, have the students fill out a doodle poll or some other kind of 
um, pull within your course, if, that, if your course management system has that, and ask them when they are typically available that they would have time to work on it, um, work on something together. Because when I'm going to talk about it with active learning, a lot of that is group participation. And if the group is frustrated and you've got two or three people that can always meet at 2 o'clock on a Tuesday and somebody says, no, I work till 6 at night, I can't do that, or I have children, or whatever the capacity is, um, it's really important to make sure you get those things. So match the students in groups when they can be available with each other. If it's not something that requires that, then um, you know you can you can move on and, and not have that be an obstacle. Um, but the difference from that first picture we looked at was everybody's there at the same time. They're all mostly on the same schedule, and some of these issues don't come up. But it is even useful to think about if you're having them if you're doing a flipped classroom kind of situation and you have um, groups that need to get together to do something prior to class, find out who's available when, and that's um, something to, for them to do as well. So thinking about active learning, this is really the, the piece that I'm concentrating on for the remainder of um, the presentation, is thinking about um, what is active learning and um, what can we do to maybe think about it differently with these kinds of tools. Um, so it really helps to initiate learning to engage and multiple strategies can be used. Um, it's mostly thinking and doing. It's really thinking um, beyond just sitting and taking notes or what, you know, listening to a lecture. Um, it can be individual activities. You can still be very active in individuals, but also paired in groups is really um, the ideal situation doing this. So a couple of things that you may have heard of or you may be currently doing in your classroom, um, this is a very classic um, think, pair, share kind of activity where students discuss um, with a partner on their search topic and keyword, and then the partner would give some feedback or suggestions. Um, in an online environment, you can still do this multiple ways. Um, have one half of the students submit their topic and keywords, and then the other half respond. Um, we must also add two additional keywords as well as possible resources like a database, a book, or a journal. Um, and then the next week, the groups reverse roles. So the responders then become the people who have to put their keywords and topics. Another activity, when you talk about active learning, whether it's face-to-face -face or online, is fishbowling. If you've never fishbowl, F-I-S-H-B-O-W-L, um, this typically has um, students that are, you know, a few students in the center of the room that talk about the issue, and the rest of the students circle around them and they listen. Um, they listen and they take notes, and then if somebody says, you know what, I've got something to add in this, I'm going to tap someone out of the fishbowl middle, and I'm going to come in and, and then give my opinion. Um, so students are given that chance to tap in or tap out if they have some ideas. If you want to do this in an online environment, you can team one, so you designate a team, two or three people, um, they start first, they give their um, Maybe it's a reading that you had them uh, look at about a particular topic. Then Team 2's members um, read the discussion that Team 1 has been having, and they might tap in with their ideas, and then um, so on and so forth. So you, this could go on for a couple of weeks, even, if you have a really crucial topic that you want them to talk about. But the um, in the online, if you're wanting to know whether or not they've had a chance to look up um, any resources to really bolster their argument, then each week the team that taps in um, has to provide some kind of resource that is um, supporting the information that they have. So that's how those, just some brief little ideas about doing this. Um, you can tell though it does take some time and planning to kind of get the, the rules or sort of the class norms about how you're going to carry this out. Um, I know that there's been some talk in this, this series about assessment, but um, this really ties in with the things that I've been talking about here too, that these are activities, but they're also assessing. So they're both. Um, you look at um, structures um, for formative assessment, um, which is just in the moment sometimes, what's happening, are students understanding where we are? I had a professor that I used to work with a lot who also calls this the boat check. Is everybody still on the boat or did somebody fall over? Um, they need a little life jacket. Anybody else have something that they want to add to this list of things that you can do um, as an informal activity? I'll wait to see in the chat.
that so many people are typing, which is good. See, this is my boat check. Everybody still on board? Are we all doing okay? <laughs> Like the money are clear. Yeah. Um, this is most students, they understand. They say, what's really not clear to you yet? And then what, what are you OK with? And I always collect those. I should have stock and no cards. Um, I should have bought stock a long time ago. I do this. I always have note cards. And you can do any of these kinds of things with note cards. Thank you for that. Yeah, pull, great. Pull everywhere. Um, I, my students this last semester, I taught an FYI, a first year seminar, and they were addicted to Kahoot. Um, we literally had a Kahoot. I'll type that in. If you're not familiar with Kahoot, yes. Um, it's literally every week they, what's the Kahoot for this week? So we did that a lot. So those are really great. Perfect. I'm glad this is being recorded because if you put any tools in this, I'm <laughs> did they get Kahoot overload? Um, I actually had them create them. So every week a pair had to come up with questions about that week's uh, reading and then they did it. So <laughs> you always flip it around and have them do it. So one of the things I wanted to talk about then, um, this is another, um, yeah, good. Hey, Ray, thanks. <laughs> So if you're not familiar um, with um, Padlet, this is another way, another tool that I use. Um, put the link in the uh, box. So this is super easy. Most of the things I'm going to give you are free or open. Um, some have upgrades if you want to upgrade and pay a little bit more, but I try to start, stick with free things because if it's not free for me, then it's not free for students typically. Um, and you have no control. Yeah, and your pod's great too. Um, so what I did this last semester was we really concentrated on um, an overarching topic that to talk with the first year seminar students about. And we had a common read, which is really about refugees. Um, it was a really interesting book. But one of the topics that came up was a topic of water. And I know there's many other learning communities and other campuses that have used water as an example. Um, it's something that everybody, we have to have it. So. Um, it's something that students, if you still get them thinking about something like that, um, it's an interesting sort of perspective that they get. So here's one way to think about um, active learning where you engage the students in coming up with questions other than, or questions or feedback other than I agree, right? So they have to come up with um, some other kind of way of implementing um, the learning here either online or they have to find a resource to help them do that. So here's an example of if, if you're going to ask them, you know, why is water important? What, is, what does water provide um, for the earth, for people, for countries, whatever it is, whatever kind of concept that you want them to look at. So here's a way to do something called four corners. And that's actually um, an active learning strategy that if you do this in the classroom, you could have them actually physically get up and go to the four corners of the room. And um, one of the, each one of these statements is in one of each of the corners. And then whichever one the students agree with, and they go to that corner, and then they have a conversation about why is this true? What kind of resources could we find? How do we, um, or I don't agree with this, and then how do I challenge that? Um, you can use this online to do the same thing. So if you've never used Padlet, um, you can type in, you pick the background, you can type in underneath each one of these statements. You can have students um, add their name or their initials. They can log in and do collaborative work in this um, format. Um, and it works really well. Um, it's free and it's open. So if you have a URL, and actually my URL is hidden, it's right underneath here, for this particular Padlet, um, underneath the green um, chalkboard, um, so you can keep adding to the conversation as the, as the semester goes on. Um, this works great in face-to-face um, -face classrooms as, as well. The next tool I'm going to talk about is Wordle. Um, it's some people, um, I have heard from people, they're very tired of Wordle. And I've heard from others, they're like, this is great. I never thought about using it this way. So I thought I would bring it up. Um, if you've never used Wordle, it's super easy. It's free. 
Um, it's not restricted to, um, most of these are not restricted to um, PC or um, Mac. There was, there's been some issues with Flash. It doesn't work well on a, on a device. Um, but if you've not used Wordle, this is what I did with the water theme. I looked up an article, this was in PLOS One, um, and then I typed, I copied and pasted the text into Wordle, and this is what spit out. You can have a whole conversation on this. Um, and this could be the conversation starter. What do you think is most important in this article? How does this fit in with the topic or theme? Thanks, Jason, for that. Um, this is also a way for students to demonstrate understanding about maybe there's a word that shows up in this article that they're not quite sure about and they could look it up. Um, there's lots of other add-ons to Wordle for any kind of word cloud um, creation. There's lots of other ones that you can find out there. Um, the other nice thing I, do, I like to do about using Wordle is finding something that's scholarly, finding an article about the topic or having the students find one, and then find one that's more in the popular media, put both of those into Wordle, in separate Wordles, and then compare the words that come up. Um, it gives students a challenge to see what's, what's important in this article versus this one, what's the authority of this person that wrote the, the scholarly journal article or, mag or the popular journal, the popular um, source. Um, it's kind of interesting to see the words that, that um, appear when we do that. So. Some suggestions there. The other part of this, if you're doing active learning throughout the semester, there is a way to continue doing this as you're concluding whatever it is. So if it's at the end of the course, um, doing something at the, at the point of completing content, if it's at the end of your instruction, if it's at the end of the semester, end of the school year, the end of a unit, something that shows that you're doing something um, that's showing at a more formal level where they've, um, students have achieved the outcomes and, and the assessment pieces that you've asked them to do. These are much more involved, um, much more time consuming, both to create and to grade. And you can see the list there of some examples of things that, that might be something that you do at the end. And so I wanted to show some examples about how you can do some digital tools and active learning uh, that go along with these kinds of activities. But before we go, before I move on to the next slide, does anybody have anything to add um, that you might do at the end of um, sort of showing mastery? Any other assignments or projects or anything that you want to contribute in the chat? A quiz. No, nobody wants that. I'm a big proponent, though, of sort of open book, open resource um, quizzes. Um, I think those actually work really well because you're asking them to use the resources that they've gathered to find the answers. We still do that, right? <laughs> yeah, live searches. Oh, um, I usually. Um, do have a student running the um, platform at the front, whatever that is, I ask a student. Um, that's how I do my needs assessment, who's already had library instruction last semester. <laughs> then it says, yep, you, you know how to do this. Let's do it together. We'll learn together. Um, so the first thing I wanted to show you then is um, if you like to do a rubric, so let's say you actually do, you have, it, maybe this is just a one shot that you're trying to see what happened at the end um, of that particular class. Um, there's a tool called Ruby Star. I'll put the link in here in the chat. Um, anybody familiar with Ruby Star? I'll do a quick, I should have done a quick poll, but that's okay. Anybody in the chat wants to talk about it? Um, what Ruby Star does is allows you to create online rubrics, but you can also print them and customize. So if you have a project, or even if you're saying um, searching for a topic, um, you can create and edit a rubric, you can have point values, you can have ratings, you could say, um, you know, achieved, not achieved, still needs work. You can um, do all kinds of modifications to this kind of a rubric, um, and it comes up with pre-populated um, criteria. As you can see there, there's a drop-down, I left a drop-down open, this is a screenshot. 
So there's all kinds of um, opportunities here to uh, develop a rubric. This is a tool that's been around a long time. Um, I know there are lots of other rubric creators. Um, this one seems to work pretty well. Um, and I really have, um, I think there's probably a million rubrics that have already been submitted by other teachers as well. So you might actually type in um, to RubyStar and look for a topic that's already been um, created. So there's RubyStar. The next one I want to talk about is Comic Life. Um, anybody else have experience using Comic Life in their classrooms? Um, so if we were going to continue on with a um, water theme, um, I created a comic called Drought World. <laughs> um, and this literally took you know, just a few minutes yesterday um, just in playing around with it. I wanted to talk about it, but I wanted to make sure you know, rule of teaching, if you can't do it or you wouldn't be willing to do it, you don't ask students to do it. So um, you could have students um, put in facts that they found in articles. Um, each student might get a page in the comic and they get to design um, what that looks like based on, you know, come up with a theme um, or design um, categories. This is, you, you can pay for this one. Um, you can do a free trial. There are lots of other comic generators to do um, something like this. Um, it's really kind of a fun, um, you know, you really have to understand where you're going with this. You know, is this really showing understanding? Um, obviously, there would be some, some need for citation for their resources, so maybe it's a challenge in doing that with this, but um, it would be a fun um, tool as well. So let me get you the link on that one, and I'll put that into the, I'll put that link into the chat. Um, this is also an homage to a, uh, I have a junior in high school who is um, thinking about animation as a career and I asked him about this. He said, of course I would make that if it was not library instruction. Um, so that's, that, that passes the 17-year-old boy test, I guess. Um, <laughs> the next one I wanted to talk about, um, and I had, and thank you in the introduction for mentioning project-based learning. Um, project-based learning is very, um, can be very complicated, um, very involved. This is something that um, you as a librarian, if you are in command of the classroom, if you're teaching it, or if you're working really in depth with your faculty, um, this is something that um, is very, very active. It can be very um, time consuming. Um, you, know, you can do short units. If you have a week or two, you can do this. You can do this for an entire semester. This could be a whole year that you've asked students to complete um, some kind of project that comes out of a topic of need. And typically this has to do with the community. So you would want them to really think about where it is that they live or where they are. If they're online, um, you know, if they're not near other people, then this, um, this becomes a challenge for them. However, the real assessment piece is a really true understanding about real life authentic learning. Um, but the um, link to the BIE, which is the Buck Institute of Education, it's out in California. Um, they have fantastic, lots and lots of free rubrics, how to set up a unit, lesson plans, all kinds of activities. And um, if you want to sort of uh, do a quick uh, whether or not you're equipped to do this, so the needs assessment on your end, but also how would you get a teacher to do this? And there are many, many schools and even higher ed uh, particular disciplines are really fond of this kind of work. They maybe don't call it project-based. Um, one class I've worked with in the past is um, working with the business school. This is really up their alley. They really want to um, create a marketing plan, come up with a you know business plan for a particular group of um, group in the community who wants to expand services, something like that. So this really is uh, very, um, takes a lot of time and effort and a lot of really deep collaboration um, with faculty. Um, no fancy tools here, just um, lots of resources at the BIE if you're really interested in this and I'd be happy to take any kinds of questions about that too. So somewhere in between getting to know what the students um, know when you come into the class um, and taking those first little assessments, what, you know, how, how's everybody doing, is there something you didn't understand, and then the very end, which is the culmination, you know, capstone projects, all those other things, there's somewhere in between. And so there's lots of tools here that I've 
um, posted um, a couple of really interesting ones if you've not used them. Pearl Trees, um, which is gathers content about all different kinds of subjects and you can um, make cross connections on concept mapping. Um, it lives online. Spicy Nodes, this is a, a colleague of mine um, from another institution. He uses this all the time with his science students, um, biology students. Um, Spicy Nodes also does a similar kind of concept map um, and will do connections between subjects and topics and you can do data and you can insert all kinds of fun things. And then the one that we use typically here um, to look at, so if you're deciding that you want students to do a group project or you want to do some kind of scheduling, um, Trello is a really good one. We use that actually for our student workers here, but you could use this in the classroom to decide which roles or which topics or how people are going to put together a project. So if you list students under each one of the um, boards on Trello, it runs um, that way, you could say, Group one is going to do these things by the end of the class. Group two is going to do these things by the time the class you will know, come back on Thursday. Group three is going to be doing you know, the end product. They're going to be putting together the presentation. And group four are going to be the judges. And then this is how you put that together. Yes, perfect, right? Um, yes, I, Trello is easy and it's free and it's really easy to customize for your own needs. So I thought I would add those there. And then, um, finally, I want to talk just a little bit about another um, tool that I use quite a bit. Um, so for staying with the same theme of, let's say, water is your topic, and I've used Poplet um, with students of multiple levels, all different kinds of students, um, whether they're in K-12 or whether, you know, all the way through higher ed. So you have the opportunity to use this. It's free. It works really well on an iPad. Um, if you have that opportunity to do that. Um, Poplet generates content, um, but whatever you type in, you can customize the colors. You can do this as a group project as well. So if you create this Poplet and you have students log in as themselves, instead of seeing all Rhonda's um, <laughs> content that I've loaded, it would show their name. So if you were in a, um, if you had them each do something, a question, or a topic keyword, you could have them type in the keywords and that would show the ones that they typed in. And then underneath that, it would show everybody else that participated in those fun boxes. Um, this one, you can also upload content. So you can upload a YouTube video. You can do a citation. You can do images, um, all kinds of things that you can add into those boxes here. So um, I didn't want to take too much away from my previous um, presenters about videos and interactive learning, but here are some uh, places that I go to for video content if I don't create it, which is a lot of work, and it, but it, sometimes it's really um, applicable depending on what you're trying to do. But if you're learning, looking for videos to add to your content, whether online or face-to-face, -face, um, just this is just a brief list of some places that I use. And then finally, um, in summary, just Thinking about all of the things that I've talked about, whether it's the teaching technique or assessment, or it's the tool that you use, um, each one of these things, there's a level. So, you know, higher up the level that you go, these are really culminating the learning experience, that summative assessment, um, the more collaboration you're going to need, probably with faculty or departments or teachers. Um, and uh, it's a great opportunity to co-teach with someone if you have that opportunity as well. So it's time for questions, I believe. Um, and I'll turn it back over to, yes. <laughs> um, Ray's asking, is it similar to period con the pyramid concept thing? Um, sort of. I think for me, it's just more about time. This is really more about how much time you invest. Um, and then how much time you invest versus how much time you expect the students to invest. Not necessarily. It's nice when we can see the end, but sometimes we don't always have that opportunity. So um, I think sometimes if you come up with a way that you can collaborate um, up front, um, gives them an idea, you know, gives the faculty or, or teachers or whoever you're trying to work with an idea and say, well, we really love to do this. It's going to take about three weeks. Can I come you know, to talk to your class and then I'll check back in on how this is going out. And that's it for me. So I'm going to turn my mic off and let our moderator take over, and then we'll go with questions. 
Okay, Rhonda, thank you so much. Uh, so much information. It was awesome. I really enjoyed the uh, hearing about the tools and engaging our learners in many different ways. And uh, I'm going to lay out uh, the request for questions now. Uh, does anybody have any questions for either of our uh, uh, groups of presenters? Uh, please feel free to type them in, and uh, I'll read them back to our presenters uh, as we go along. So gather your thoughts, and if you have some questions, please uh, feel free to uh, include them in the chat. And uh, Rhonda, I don't think you overwhelmed anyone. There was a lot of information, but I think it was terrific. So again, if we have any questions, lingering thoughts uh, uh, from either of our present uh, presenters, uh, our groups of presenters, uh, please feel free to type them in. Okay, a question uh, from Rhonda. Uh, going to uh, first group of presenters from George Washington. How much time uh, does it take to make a two or three minute video or tutorial? That's actually a really great question. This is Shira. So you would think that a two minute video um, is really short. It can be done really quickly. But it's actually fairly labor intensive. Um, at least the way we do it, you can do some like quick ones where it's just a screen capture and you're talking at the same time just to do like, you know, if you want to answer a reference question or something uh, with a video over email. But if the way the ones that we do where we script them out, um, share them with each other, edit them, um, it's a pretty long process. Um, also because we don't do it all at the same time, so it, it's a little bit difficult, I guess, to have an exact answer, yeah. but um, like, so we workshop them, so let's say we have like a few one-hour meetings um, kind of spaced out where we're sharing our scripts with each other, um, but once we get the scripts sort of straightened out, um, to do the actual editing in Camtasia that we do, um, I would say it takes a few hours, including um, recording, which doesn't take too long since we have the scripts already written. But of course, if you make mistakes, you uh, might start over or something. But really, it's just the, the time consuming part of it um, is just planning and then doing all the editing. So I would say it takes um, several hours, at least, to make a two minute video. I hope that Answers. And I don't know if you have any other things to add, Jocelyn and Tina. Um, yeah, and I think like, I think, oh, this is Tina, sorry. Um, I think um, just kind of um, adding to that, we may have two or three meetings where we're workshopping the ideas, and again, those are about an hour, hour and a half. Um, once we have the scripts and we record the audio, that might be, um, I think we kind of give ourselves two hours to do that, but it may not be that long. And then working on it individually definitely takes some time. I feel like, like, like I've read somewhere that like in Hollywood, like ten pa like ten pages of script is like a minute video or something like that. And I kind of feel like that when we do our videos, but the it seems like we like several hours of time goes into just making a two-minute video. Yeah, one of the things that always surprises me, this is Jocelyn, um, one of the things that always surprises me is that um, you know, in order to find those um, Creative Commons images um, to, yeah, so I mean we have to do the screen capture videos and then um, we often will use like a kind of PowerPoint slides. And so then to find the Creative Commons images to use that really kind of capture the point that we're trying to get across, um, I feel like that takes some time. Mm -hmm. um, it adds up. Like it, it adds up because you know you want to get the timing just right, so you want the arrows to appear and disappear at just the right time. Um, so I feel like if you were to spend, like, be pretty dedicated 
but you know, with time to do other stuff, you could complete it in a week. Yeah. Um, it just depends on how focused you are. Um, does that help? Does anyone have any like kind of clarifying questions? Jason. Okay, thank you for your response. Uh, did have another uh, question, this one coming from Jason. Do you ever have a sense of technology overload uh, for students uh, with using any of these technologies? And you have varying strategies uh, uh, for their usage. And I think you can go to either one of our groups if you'd like to respond. Do you want me to go first? <laughs> this is Rhonda. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, yes. Absolutely. Um, I would probably not use all of these and not even half of these in a class. Um, if I had an entire semester of, let's say I was teaching a class of teachers that were trying to use instructional technology, we would probably we would cover these in an entire semester. This would not be something that I would do um, this, you know, this is where the needs assessment really comes into play. So even a you know even if you're in person in class and you say to students, um, or that's the flipped, so you have them do a survey before they come. How comfortable are you with the following technologies? Have you reused them before? If no one in the class has ever used Poplet, you're going to ex spend a lot of your time rather than maybe teaching the content you're trying to teach is teaching them how to use Poplet, right? So that's not the intent. Um, if they are familiar with some of the other kinds of, co let's say, concept mapping things, you can find a list of them. If somebody, um, if half the class has used it, then you're not spending your time trying to get them up to speed. However, sometimes it is actually, depending on the outcome, is it, are you trying to get them to use other kinds of technologies in order to accomplish a task? Um, have them review the technology hat, you know, say, um, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be doing a project where I'm going to ask you to, um, you know, determine the need of, let's say, the four corners that I use the Padlet. Then have each group evaluate a couple of different places that they could um, use to post their arguments and say, you know what, Padlet really was the best place for this. Then that's how you would know that that's the one that you should use with the students. Um, for me, it's just being really selective. Um, and not making sure that it is overloading or overwhelming them. Um, the other thing too is that not skipping around and using a bunch of different things because some students, if they're in other classes and they're overwhelmed already, so if you said, okay, now this week we're going to use Padlet and the next week we're going to do this thing, unless that is part of the class content, um, I would not suggest skipping around and doing a whole bunch of things with, a, with um, without some sort of understanding that that's actually what we're trying to do in this class. Um, so that's why in the beginning when we said we did Kahoot every week, well, they knew what was coming, they know how to use it. Um, it's not super creative, um, but um, not overwhelming them in the way that they, they can be. So that's just my, <laughs> my thought about that. Anything, I'll let the other speakers chime in. Um, we don't, I guess the only thing, sorry, this is Jocelyn, um, I think the only thing that um, I would add is that we don't have, we don't like give technology to students to use, um, but in terms of being overloaded, um, we do recommend like our colleagues that we're helping who are creating their own videos, we recommend that they just go to like their level of interest. So for example, they just want they want to create a video, but they're not, you know, super technology savvy. Like we have a colleague who makes Jane videos, which his faculty love. Um, you don't have to use Camtasia if using that kind of software is overwhelming. Um, Okay, I'm not sure if you dropped out a little bit, but I'll jump in here. Uh, thank you for the responses. Uh, I like Rhonda's uh, response as well. Uh, sending a survey to faculty, 
uh, check with the teaching learning to see if there's anything else that they've used or had training on. Um, are there uh, any other questions or comments to uh, either of our presenters? Okay, uh, if we, uh, we don't have any further additional questions, I am going to uh, type a, uh, in the, in the uh, chat box a uh, survey, a link to a survey. So if you have a moment, uh, please feel free to uh, take our survey. And uh, uh, I think there's four questions and an open-ended question. We'd appreciate any sort of feedback that you can give us uh, on our presentation. Uh, if uh, you don't have any other questions, uh, I'm going to uh, echo Cynthia's uh, uh, comment. It was wonderful. Thank you so much to all of our presenters. Uh, your uh, willingness to share your expertise and knowledge on your topics was greatly appreciated by all of us. So, uh, yeah, if uh, uh, barring any other questions, I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the chat. Uh, and we, again, appreciate all of you for attending our webinar today and uh, look forward to uh, checking out the uh, link uh, to the LERP page uh, for a uh, link to the recording of uh, our presentation today. So, again, thank you all for coming and uh, have a great day.